but it's fine after the lunch <laughs> and I'm happy to open the second track about SSL. We have here with us Tal from Imperva and um, in my youth I was a great fan of the film noir, the black mm. series in Hollywood and there was an eternal rule due to the Hollywood Codex and censorship, crime doesn't pay even not a perfect one. <laughs> Is this true? Please tell us. Tell. <laughs> well, I guess only time will tell. Uh, so I hope in 14 minutes time we'll be smarter about uh, crime and is there a perfect crime and whether or not it pays and in which uh, currency. So uh, let's start. Uh, what we're going to t discuss today, we'll start with a brief introduction. Uh, so we would uh, all have a common background on uh, compression and also we'll take uh, a second look at the crime attack already mentioned in a few talks here. Then we will move to expand crime in two different directions. One direction is by increasing the attack surface by applying the crime mm -hmm. attack to HTTP responses where the original crime attack was attacking uh, HTTP requests and secondly we will uh, uh, show the time attack which really helps the attacker uh, to uh, drop the precondition of being a, a man in the middle or being an eavesdropper and uh, replacing that precondition with just the ability uh, to measure times which can be achieved by a JavaScript and therefore uh, the attacker does not have to be uh, an eavesdropper. So uh, let's talk about the attack surface to begin with. So where do we have a uh, compression on the web? And this is the, uh, was the situation before, cri before the crime and the changes that were made as a result of it. So uh, compression over the web is largely based on the gzip algorithm and the most common compression when you tell someone HTTP compression naturally you you would probably mean the HTTP response body compression and not something else but there are some other less common compressions such as the HTTP request body in post requests as uh, some clients uh, support that and also some header compression that uh, in certain cases such as when the the whole SSL channel is compressed which was uh, supported by Google Chrome until recently and also in Speedy, sometimes dubbed as uh, HTTP 2.0, uh, which has uh, large support over uh, clients, all, all browsers except uh, Internet Explorer, but not so much on uh, servers. So the main uh, use case for compression over the web is for HTTP responses. Uh, so let's take a deeper look at the GZIP compression. It's really a two-step compression uh, process, combining two algorithms together. It combines the LZ77 to compress reoccurring string and Huffman coding to compress frequent uh, symbols. And GZIP was uh, uh, made the, uh, the compression algorithm of the web probably because it achieves a good balance between uh, the compression rate and the performance uh, uh, and the uh, resources needed for the compression. So Lampel-Ziv compress uh, repeating strings. This is Lampel-Ziv, it's the LZ and LZ77, which is that algorithm was proved to be asymptotically optimal. And one interesting uh, feature of it is there is no overhead. There are no extra dictionaries transmitted between the sites and it's best explained with an example if we take the, two, the first two verses of the genesis so uh, we can see that in natural uh, language if we can call genesis natural language uh, then uh, there is a lot of repetition of strings so, in, so instead of coding uh, the second uh, uh, space equal space uh, de and then space in the beginning God created the heaven so I can code this, the second the as a pointer to the previous one and by that I will compress that uh, input and we can see as the 
text is getting richer and, and bigger, there are more reoccurring strings and the better compression uh, it achieves. And the other part of the gzip compression is Huffman coding. Uh, there is, even if we compress all reoccurring strings, there's still redundancy uh, in the text in the sense that some letters are more frequent than others. For example, uh, the E uh, letter is very uh, frequent in, uh, in uh, is the most frequent uh, letter in English compared to Q, so I would probably be better off if I could encode uh, E with fewer bits and the expense of coding uh, Q or Z with more bits. And we only, our main interested interest in uh, compression will be focused around the LZ of uh, algorithm of compressing recurrent strings, but we still need to uh, say something about this Hoffman coding because it will kind of uh, will be troubling for us because uh, as a result of this coding uh, the symbols are not necessarily byte aligned and some of them will be shorter than a single byte which kind of uh, uh, maybe might be a problem for us in later stages we'll talk about it so let's talk about the relationship between compression and encryption and uh, so there is compression, there's encryption, so we need to compress the data to save uh, bandwidth on the one hand, and on the other hand, we want to compress it to protect its privacy. So what should we apply first? Should we compress and then encrypt, or encrypt and then compress? Uh, of course, we need to first compress, and only then we can encrypt, because uh, encryption uh, really conceals all the redundancy within the original text and applying compression on encrypted data uh, does not help uh, and if someone tried to compress once uh, an encrypted uh, file you would uh, see that uh, that the compression was not very successful so uh, it was detected as early in 2002, actually, in a scientific paper that compression is really can leak some information about the plain text. And uh, this was uh, very early compared to uh, a decade ago, which is uh, infinity in the terms of uh, security. And it was uh, independently rediscovered by Rizzo and Duong. And, but Rizzo and Duong were also uh, pioneers in the sense that they s showed that this theoretical problem is very practical and relevant to our actual uh, uh, web environment. And they dubbed their uh, attack as crime, compression ratio info leak made easy, which is a chosen plain text attack, and we'll talk about that, and targets compression information leakage. So what is it? chosen plain text uh, attack. Uh, the attacker has the ability to choose arbitrary plain text to be encrypted and obtain the corresponding ciphertext. So Eve can tell Alice what to send to Bob and then Eve's also an eavesdropper and get to see the encrypted message traveling through the wire. So this is the attack model. And what crime is trying to do, we'll, talk, we'll give first the intuition, then we'll uh, get some uh, more rigorous uh, description. So uh, the attacker, uh, this is chosen playtext, tell the victim to send something to the web server, and this uh, it, it, the attacker tells the victim to do so, but with the JavaScript, and the Java uh, this uh, text contains some guess of the attacker about the secret part of the text. And uh, as we said, the LZ part of the compression will compress identical strings. So if the attacker guess was correct, then the result will, will be that the payload will be better compressed, will have shorter uh, length, and the attacker will be able to observe it uh, since he is uh, or she is uh, man in the middle, or eavesdropper. 
So in a more uh, rigorous uh, description of this, uh, so the attacker starts with initial guess uh, with some kind of known prefix of the uh, of the secret string, and then tries to append every letter within the alphabet and observe the results of the payload size over the over the network and. Uh, if the, for the correct guess, then the result will be shorter than all other guesses. guesses. And, and this uh, process can be applied in a repeated manner until the whole secret is revealed. And if we take it into the uh, web environment, then it uh, carries an eavesdropper and can see the cipher text uh, over SSL. And the uh, attacker creates an HTTP request interactively uh, with the uh, JavaScript. And the attacker has almost full control over the URL and can predict most of the header. But uh, the attacker does not control or see the cookies because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't see them on the wire because they are encrypted. And it cannot access them uh, through the script because of the same origin policy. So let's just show an example. So the attacker will do something like uh, post or get session ID equals A, and, and then B, and then C, and so forth. And when the session ID equals D is a repeating string uh, within the cookie, then uh, the payload will get more, will be compressed in a more successful way and resulting a shorter payload over the network and the attacker will be able to observe it and then the attacker will know that D was the correct guess and can move on to guess the next character until the whole cookie is revealed. And this is really uh, what this slide uh, showed. This is one of the slides, uh, the original slides of uh, Duong and uh, Rizzo from last year. So uh, there is a, a little uh, problem here with the Huffman coding that we had mentioned earlier because sometimes we cannot detect a good guess because uh, when we add a character that is very frequent, even if it's not a correct guess, then the Huffman coding will compress it. It's not, not because of the LZ, not because of, of it being a reoccurring string, just because it is uh, a very common string, a very common symbol that can be compressed uh, better. So in order to really differentiate between, uh, uh, between the different effects of the LZ algorithm and the Huffman coding, uh, the attacker can send two requests and uh, just changing the order uh, of the symbols and uh, uh, the LZ the algorithm is very sensitive to changes while the Huffman uh, uh, coding is not, the context is not relevant, it just cares for the, uh, the distribution of the symbols. So in that, uh, using that, we can eliminate that uh, effect of the Hoffman coding. And so as a result of this research, uh, speed implementation uh, cancel or modify header compression and Chrome disabled uh, SSL compression. So there is no request uh, compression and therefore no more crime since there is no attack surface. So let's start by resurrecting crime and applying it to responses so it will have some uh, attack surface. So what do we have to do in order to uh, transform crime from attacking uh, request to attacking responses? So the encryption and compression algorithms are the same. And of course, we're changing the secret element location from the request header to the response body, which is OK. So we still need to figure out three things. We need to find a secret element, which was uh, uh, the cookie value in the previous uh, a crime uh, attacking request, and this secret should have a, some kind of prefix or suffix, so we'll, we will have an uh, initial guess for us. And, w and this is maybe the most important uh, and the hardest issue of all, the attacker needs to control some part of the, the response, uh, so it can uh, be compressed along with the secret. 
but in, in the case of requests, it's very trivial because the attacker directly controls the URL. But uh, in the responses, uh, the response com comes back with the server, so it's not very obvious how the attacker can control uh, the server's uh, response and include some arbitrary text within it. So let's start with the easier issues. So luckily, th there are many secrets in responses. Uh, in fact, most of the secrets of the applications are found in their responses. Th think about your bank balance. It appears in there on the response, right? And they are often very structured. L again, let's take the balance, uh, bank balance uh, example again. So your bank might tell you, this is your bank balance. And then the amount will show up. So there, usually the secrets are structured. So th it's not too hard to find secrets, structured s secrets. Uh, although there are many of them, but we have to remember that now they are application specific, you know, for the bank it will be your bank balance and for Facebook it will be, I don't know, some, something else, maybe your Facebook ID or something like that. It's not like uh, the case where in crime that you always could aim for the cookie. And so we are left with finding the last element of chosen play text location, uh, which was the URL for taking requests. So uh, we found out that, uh, well, after we find out, it's very natural to think that uh, we would find that, but uh, many application embeds user inputs as expressed with HTTP parameters within their re response. And in fact, many uh, websites uh, embed uh, elements from the request in their response even if uh, they were not expecting such elements in the request. For example, we can see here at the bottom of the screen that uh, Twitter, uh, if you append some uh, random parameters such x equals mic string, then this input will be embedded within the response. So the attacker can control and, f and put some arbitrary strings within the response. So we have all the ingredients and uh, we can uh, cook ourselves uh, some uh, crime attack on responses. And for example, we we'll try to do the same uh, with the Google Scholar and trying to find out the secret uh, username and by uh, putting some uh, parameter, guessing uh, parameter over the URL. And we were uh, able to do so and uh, as this uh, video shows that we started with the suffix that time from at gmail.com and our algorithm is uh, guessing the full uh, email of the victim in a character by character uh, fashion. So let's, let's move on, but eventually it will get uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, email. So let's sum up uh, the advantages and disadvantages of moving the attack from the response to the, from the request to the response. So HTTP response body compression is very common practice as opposed to uh, request uh, compression, and it's uh, part of the building block of the of the internet. It's not something you can easily uh, turn off. And, and this is more of a philosophical, if you like, uh, argument that uh, when you're attacking the data in the response, you're attacking the secret data itself and not some, uh, some kind of intermediate, uh, a cookie uh, or so. And, but there are also disadvantages. For example, the user uh, input must be encoded before, uh, before it gets embedded into the response. If the website does not uh, uh, um, uh, un properly encode it, then it, it will have some grave issues of cross uh, scripting and so forth. So uh, the attacker alphabet is really limited to alphanumeric uh, sort of uh, text. So the attacker can only guess alphanumeric uh, secrets. And the environment is less sterile. For example, 
response body might be altered to the other reasons we saw responses that included uh, the date and the time and, and so forth so uh, it's when you have more uh, uh, more processes that really changes uh, the size uh, and the plain text of the uh, of the text it makes it harder for the attacker uh, to really say which of his guesses were correct because it doesn't know if the payload get is smaller because the guess was correct or because uh, something else changes the plain text. So, uh, in that, so responses are much more less sterile than uh, requests. So, uh, let's move on to our second uh, uh, improvement of the crime uh, algorithm, and this is the time attack. And as we recall, crime attack model. If the attacker in the attacker the attacker needs to be both an eavesdropper and have control over the web page the victim visits in so having control over the uh, of the over the web page the victim visits in it's not so hard but uh, but being able also to observe uh, its traffic uh, uh, with another side this is a different matter and usually to be an eavesdropper you need to get to be in some physical proximity within your victim, for example, in a wireless, unencrypted wireless LAN or uh, app poisoning of a local network and so forth. So it's, it's a rather big limitation and it would make the attack more practical if you can just drop that limitation. So uh, what we had presented, the uh, back in uh, Black Hat Europe uh, this year, uh, it, the time attack, the timing in Fulik uh, made easy, the uh, uh, successor of crime, and uh, really, uh, let's try to follow the, the uh, it's kind of complex argument, what, but we can uh, uh, break it down to three uh, more simple arguments. So. First, we have to establish that the HTTP payload size may carry sensitive information. And in fact, we only need to show that uh, payload size differences carry that sensitive information, which is kind of what this crime is all about. Uh, that's what we've uh, shown, that being able to, de to detect small changes in on the payload size uh, is the key. Uh, this is what the attacker is doing with the, with the crime attack, and by detecting these small uh, differences, uh, the attacker is able to uh, determine which of the guesses of, it, of their guesses is the correct one. And after that, we establish that the uh, small differences uh, really of payload size really carry sensitive information. Will sh show that using time measurements. Uh, the attacker can distinguish uh, these payload size differences and therefore extract the secret within them. And finally, we need to show that these timing measurements can be carried out by a JavaScript. So if, if we will show all of, of th these uh, three different elements and combine them together, we will show that using a JavaScript, the attacker can uh, detect the secret information uh, that is carried over the uh, over the payload size differences, and if it if it can be done with the JavaScript, then the attacker needs not to be an eavesdropper and just can give that JavaScript to the to the victim. Uh, so this is a different uh, uh, this is chosen pl uh, chosen plain text uh, attack model, but without. Uh, eavesdropping uh, ability. Eaves is no longer an eavesdropper. So let's talk about sensitive information in HTTP payload size. So we had seen that uh, the attacker can uh, uh, can find out about secret information just looking at the different payload sizes uh, over uh, requests and responses for the crime attack, but it's not necessarily con uh, directly uh, only connected to the crime attack. For example, if we take, uh, again, the bank 
uh, balance uh, uh, page, uh, we, we'll take it another look at it. And let's say that everything is constant within th this page except uh, the number of digits in your balance. So we all can uh, agree that uh, the number of digits I have in my balance is sensitive information. And, uh, and you know, attacker would like to know if he's attacking a victim w that has uh, only one digit in its bank balance or nine digits in its bank balance. So this is sensitive information. And let's say there is no compression and so forth. So if we can detect just the difference in this payload and we know that the constant factors are, let's say, one kilobyte and the rest is, uh, is just the digits uh, in your balance, then uh, I can just by, by comparing the different results, I can learn if you have eight digits in, in your bank balance or just one. So we had seen that uh, this payload size is not uh, revealing secret data is not only related to the crime attack. And so I th think that's enough to, c I, I hope it's enough to convince you that uh, payload size differences uh, is, uh, in, uh, is sufficient to extract the sensitive uh, information. And now we move on to see how we can y do it just by timing measurements. So the intuition is pretty clear. The first thing that's uh, on a Google developer website is how to make the web faster, minimize the payload size. So size and timing are very much related to one another. And Google web page uh, even give a, another tip for developers and says, in addition to the network cost of actual bytes transmitted, there's also a penalty incurred for crossing an IP packet boundary. And when we hit the word boundary, we, we understand that this is something we can use because when you cross a boundary and you pay, suddenly you pay a, a, lot, a fine. You don't just uh, pay linearly, but you get an extra fine for crossing a, an IP packet boundary. Then there's something we can use in order to, as attackers, in order to detect uh, changes in payload uh, sizes. So a more accurate saying will be that you pay this fine when you cross some a TCP window value. So because client sends a window of packets and wait a round trip time, RTT time for acknowledgement. And uh, this acknowledgement uh, time, this uh, round trip time is very noticeable. And therefore the attacker can easily di distinguish between uh, payloads that their uh, size are uh, smaller or equal to the window and even the, if they exceed that window, even with one byte, then they will pay an extra round trip time fine and then the attacker will be able to detect it just by measuring timing. And let's see this uh, phenomena with Chrome. Uh, so Chrome sends two packets and then wait for round trip time. And if you need to send three packets, you pay extra round trip time, as we can see there in the red uh, rectangle here, that you, you wait uh, uh, 100, almost 170 milliseconds more uh, for the acknowledgement to arrive before uh, you can complete, the client can complete its request and send that one extra byte. Uh, so it's very noticeable. And the same goes for the response. And this is a recording and pickup of Apache. And again, every uh, three packets that Apache stops and waits for acknowledgement, this time uh, it takes it, uh, the round trip time was uh, around 180 uh, milliseconds. So uh, we had seen that uh, small differences can create uh, big differences with timing. Now it just remains to see if we can uh, capture all of this using just, but just by using a JavaScript. So, uh, 
what we'll do, we'll create uh, for requests, we'll create an XHR request, XML HTTP request, and uh, we don't care for the responses, we just, this is, we just want, uh, uh, we just want uh, to get uh, the request out, and we use the get time uh, function of JavaScript and on on already state change, so we can uh, time uh, the, the time for the request. And uh, noise uh, elimination because timing is very sensitive to noise. For example, if there is uh, some delays over the network, then it changes uh, your measurement. But if you take enough measurement, you can cancel that noise. Uh, we, we cancel it by taking, uh, by repeating each uh, request ten times, and then then obtaining the minimal time of it. And so let's see our result. On the left hand side, you can see the results from uh, the web developer console of uh, Chrome, and the right side you can see the, our script uh, results, and with alternating. Uh, uh, sizes. Here we say we send alternatively uh, uh, sometimes 2,515 bytes, and uh, on the other request 2,000 uh, one less byte, we, and we and then we minimize. We take the minimal value of all these 10 requests, and we can see that timing can be correctly captured. Our results uh, with JavaScript of very similar to the results that are obtained uh, with the developer console and the results are conclusive and we can easily detect uh, the, uh, using the, 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 previ the previously discussed uh, timing uh, boundary that, uh, that extra round trip time, we can easily detect it with JavaScript. And this was for requests. We can apply a similar logic for responses. Uh, first, we try to do it with uh, by loading iframes, uh, but this was foiled by the Xframe option headers that was meant to uh, block uh, clickjacking. So not all sites implement it, but uh, some sites do. But if we you take something that does not adhere to the X-Frame option header. For example, if you load an image, so the image will be fetched and uh, you will receive the image uh, response and only then the browser will tell you, well, this is not an image, I'm not presenting it, but it will travel over the wire and will get compressed and so forth. So uh, we get the payload that we need and we can uh, measure its time. So let's revisit our argument about uh, about the time and attack. So we had shown the HTTP payload size may carry sensitive information, and moreover, we showed that HTTP payload size differences is sufficient to detect. You don't need the absolute value of the payload size. And using timing measurements, attacker can distinguish HTTP payload size differences because of that boundary effect of the TCP window. And these measurements can be carried out by JavaScript. So collapsing all these argument, different arguments together so the attacker can give the victim that uh, JavaScript that will measure the timing and will detect the differences uh, in the timing. And the, therefore, the attacker no longer needs to be an eavesdropper and the, by thus making that attack even more practical. So what can we do to prevent this kind of attack? So let's start. Uh, uh, OK, uh, so let's conclude what we had seen here. Uh, we had shown uh, different, uh, uh, we showed di two different uh, improvements to the crime attack one that was related to applying it to response except and not to request and the other one was 
to uh, extending it so uh, you know the attacker no longer needs to be an eavesdropper and as we said it's not uh, this uh, uh, payload differences attack are not necessarily related to the uh, crime attack as we had seen the for example that bank balance even if there was a, a no compression then this sort of vulnerability uh, exists in this uh, web page. Uh, so what wouldn't work? So uh, an instinct uh, reaction will say, okay, if the attacker is measuring timing, then we'll just add some random time delays. But uh, of course, as the, um, this was the uh, reaction for the discovery of the Lucky 13 attack. And of course, adding some random time delays it's not so he it's so hard to uh, to the attacker to uh, cope with as they can just launch uh, some more uh, request and average out the this random uh, uh, time delay so i think random time delays wouldn't work what would work if browser could uh, support and respect uh, x frame options to all content inclusions and not just iframes. If you could control the way that your resources will be shown uh, uh, for all resources, not just for iframes. And, uh, so, and so what should application owners do? Uh, they should implement CISA protection, uh, use the X-Frame option header where possible, Beware of an uh, unknown parameter, as which shown with Twitter, because the attacker needs somewhere to put his own input uh, in order to, uh, so it will be included in the response. So we have shown in the Twitter case that it happens even uh, for parameters that you are not expecting to see. So it's very important to detect the use of. Uh, un unknown uh, parameters, new parameters, and deploy anti-automation measures as, uh, well, Angela actually hates uh, uh, captures, but uh, it was uh, in Google case when we attacked uh, the Google Scholar, then in some cases we triggered uh, Google's uh, anti-automation uh, uh, policy and it actually blocked us with the CAPTCHA. So this is uh, a good ex example of good use of CAPTCHA when it only disturbs the bad guys, which were us in, the, in this case. So, uh, well, maybe CAPTCHA is bad, but currently it's one of the, our best solution for anti-automation, and when it's it being used right only for users that create a lot of traffic, uh, then it's uh, acceptable. So. Uh, with that, I conclude. If there are any questions, Tal, thank you very much for your talk. Now I understand your introduction. Only time will tell. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Sebastian, the expert for uh, timing attacks. Okay. Say, um, this is more like an understanding question. So. Uh, What's your attacker model like? So, do, because, I mean, yeah. How do you? Is it? Isn't it just a coincidence that response is like just at the boundary of that window size? Mm -hmm. It's just a coincidence. No, no. It's just because uh, one of the preconditions uh, for the attack is that the attacker will be able to include some uh, part that it control that he or she controls, right? Regardless of the. Uh, uh, the timing boundary, so it will be compressed, so the attacker can uh, can artificially expand it and put it exactly on the boundary of of, uh, of a window. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so it needs to have that ability. Okay, just one more question. Sorry, um, what is the? Um, uh, I haven't seen it in your slides. What's the difference to the breach attack that uh, like Prado? Um, uh, Okay. Presented at Black Hat this year in the States. Yeah. Are there? Okay, there's a hidden. Ugh, unhide. 
So Did you compress it? Or okay. No? So a, this is a, a bit of a timeline. So we had mentioned the 2002, the original paper, scientific paper, and crime in 2012. I had presented uh, all the contents of this talk were given in the Black Hat Europe on March 2013, and it was rediscovered uh, by uh, Luke Harris and Prado uh, on recent Black Hat, and we approached them, and they gave uh, they didn't know our work, and g they gave us uh, credit for that. Uh, but you know, it's good for uh, for everybody that this kind of attack get uh, noticed. So thank you for that. And if there are more questions, uh, I will be probably at, uh, I'll be at the Impeva booth with a, a card there, uh, so you can uh, drop by and ask questions and say nice things about my uh, presentation if you like. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Todd.